now call this meeting of the Jacksonville City Council to order. I want to welcome everyone who has come out tonight for the meeting and also those that will be viewing the meeting on the G10 uh, channel. I'd like to begin tonight by uh, I have several members of the Roland Thunder chapter here in, in Jacksonville, Alonso County present, and I would like for them to uh, lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance tonight, uh, followed by the invocation by our City Attorney John Carter. Please rise. States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Heavenly Father, we pause as always to give you thanks. To give you thanks for the blessings that you daily bestow upon us corporately as the city of Jacksonville and upon us each individual. We especially give thanks for all those service members and our armed forces who have served and sacrificed for the freedoms that we daily enjoy. And especially for those who will be remembered tomorrow who lost their lives 30 years ago in Beirut, be with their family members and all those in attendance at that anniversary remembrance service. And as always, we ask your guidance and direction to be with our mayor and with our council. This we ask in your holy name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Council, uh, you have a copy of tonight's agenda along with the consent items that uh, should have a copy in front of you. Uh, entertain a motion now to adopt the agenda and the consent items. So moved. Second. I have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Next, we have the approval of minutes. We have an October 8, 2013 special workshop meeting and an October 8, 2013 regular meeting. Mayor Phillips, I move that we approve the October 8, 2013 special workshop minutes uh, meeting and the October 8, uh, 2013 regular meeting minutes as presented. We have a motion. And a second. All any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed. Minutes have been approved. Next, we have some presentations. We have uh, a few presentations tonight, and I will come around front here. <coughs> The first uh, I would like to presentation I'd like to, to do tonight, I would like to ask uh, Mr. Paul Levesque if you'd come up front uh, and join me. Uh, Paul, I think you have something you want to read from. <clears throat> the Department of Veterans Affairs has designated the city of Jacksonville as an official regional site for Veterans Day observances for the third year in a row. Jacksonville is one of the 64 communities nationwide and one of only four sites in North Carolina to have received this honor. Rolling Thunder organizes the city's annual Veterans Day Parade, which this year will be on Saturday, November 9th. And I've been told that you have a little bit of report on that designation, how that came about. Yes, sir. Uh, as the mayor said, uh, this is the, the third consecutive year that the Department of Veterans Affairs National uh, Veterans Day Committee has recognized Jacksonville, North Carolina uh, as a regional site for uh, observance of Veterans Day 
uh, and this is uh, from the, I have a certificate here which I will present to the mayor from the Department of Veterans Affairs, the Veterans Day National Committee, hereby designates Jacksonville, North Carolina as a regional site for the observance of Veterans Day 2013 and assigned by Eric K. Shinseki, Secretary of the VA, Chairman, Veterans Day National Committee. Did I get that right? Secretary. Secretary. <laughs> well, I, I made you. I, I promoted you. <laughs> so who are you? <laughs> um, this is presented to Rolling Thunder NC5 on behalf of the Ansel Vietnam Veterans Memorial Foundation with grateful appreciation for your assistance and support of the annual motorcycle run and rally. Oh, that's Thank you nice. very much. <laughs> We're glad we can help and support that uh, awesome nice. event every year, and uh, we'll continue to do so. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate what you did. Yes, sir. Thank you. This time I'd like to ask Officer uh, S Vanessa Smith, uh, Terry, Terry Miller from the Justice Academy, and Chief Yanera, if you would come forward, please. <coughs> also, Brad, come up here and be with your wife. <laughs> <coughs> I'll put my good jeans on for this. Oh, don't worry about <laughs> it. Don't worry about that. <coughs> Officer Vanessa Smith of the Jacksonville Police Department recently completed the Traffic Enforcement and Investigation Certificate Program at the North Carolina Justice Academy. This program recognizes the achievement of law enforcement pro professionals who have dedicated themselves to making the highways safer for our citizens. And Terry, Terry Miller is an instructor at the Academy and he's here and he's going to explain a little bit about how this program Well, the Traffic Enforcement Investigation Certificate Program is a program, uh, a specialized program where officers come and take specialized traffic enforcement training. Uh, they do traffic crash reconstruction, that sort of stuff, radar, uh, and different things to further their knowledge uh, from BLET. The program is 500 hours. They have to complete 500 hours of training and since its inception in 1999, there's only been 225 so far to complete the program. Uh, I'd like to say I'm, I'm number 29. Uh, but Vanessa is number 220. So out of uh, those probably 14 years, I'd say, uh, she is the 220th recipient of this award or certification. And, uh, she is the 14th female to have completed it. So uh, that's a pretty good significant uh, number there. 
So I congratulate you on your completion of this. And this is a this is the certificate. This is from North Carolina Justice Academy issues uh, this certificate. Therefore, certifying that Vanessa Fulmer Smith has completed the prescribed specialized hours in traffic enforcement investigation certificate program. That's a, that's very nice. You know, thank you, Vanessa. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Terry, sure do appreciate you coming all the way down to Jacksonville. Thank, Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you. you very much. <clears throat> that's, that's quite a feat there. Very good job. Not that I don't enjoy doing that. I got one I really especially enjoy right here. Carolyn. Come here. Come on up here. Carolyn Lamp. This is the lady that keeps the mayor straight. <laughs> Makes him on time, tells him what to say, when to say it. You know, handles a lot of stuff for me. Very good. Um, she's made a, quite an accomplishment here, I understand, from talking to. Uh, Carmen Miracle, our city clerk, that you're one of the few that have been able to successfully uh, make it through this. Is that, is that true? Yeah. <clears throat> the Certified Municipal Clerk Program is an educational program through the School of Government at UNC Chapel Hill designed to enhance the job performance of the municipal and deputy clerk. To earn the uh, certif Certified Municipal Clerk designation, the candidate must over the course of one year, attend four intensive uh, education sessions and pass, no wonder you weren't here, <laughs> four intensive education sessions and pass a written examination at the end of each session. The candidate must also acquire on-the-job experience by working in a municipal clerk's office as well as engage and participate in community service activities. Carolyn began her career with the city on August 17, 2009, and on September 23rd, the city was notified that she had completed all the requirements necessary to earn the certified municipal clerk designation. Ms. Lamp is the first Jacksonville deputy city clerk to have completed all of the requirements to receive this prestigious designation, and we're very proud of it. And I got something. Nice. This is the uh, certified municipal clerk uh, certificate, and it's very pretty, very pretty frame too. But uh, anyway, congratulations. <laughs> she has time to do all that because her husband does the cooking at home. <laughs> Please, by all means. I just want to uh, thank the city for giving me the opportunity to actually become part of the city. Um, I really love working here and I want to thank the mayor and all the city council because they are just superb to work for and all the employees within the city are great. I mean, everyone really cares about what happens with this city and, and it's a pleasure to work here. I'm just thankful to be here. Thank you. Our pleasure. <laughs> And, I, and you were balancing all that stuff you were doing with, for me with all that stuff you were doing for school. That's, that's just amazing, amazing. All right, I'm gonna take a brief pause here for just a second. I know that a lot of you came tonight for the uh, presentations and uh, I'll give you a moment or two that you can uh, uh, get up and, and leave or vacate the premises if that's what you wish to do. Uh, you're welcome to stay for the rest of the business meeting by all means but uh, I don't know why you would want to. But... <laughs> Thank you all for coming, all of you.
Thanks, Paul. Business first item. Uh, next item we got is the public comment section. And I have one person signed up for public comment. And Kevin, there you are. Good evening, Mayor Kevin O'Connor, 210, and City Council. Kevin O'Connor, 210 Newport Drive, uh, Jacksonville. Um, simply put, the, the county commissioners didn't like what I said last night, so they sent me down here. Um, <laughs> And, and I'm going to quote, and this is in regards to the sales tax distribution, and I quote, because part of my argument was is that most of the people down there in North Topsail Beach are rental properties and they get to write everything off. So I quote, a game room or recreation room make this a big hit for vacation rentals, bringing in a gross rental income of 180.6 thousand in 2012 and 187.1 thousand in rental income as of 10-14-2013. That's pretty good money, wouldn't you think? Me being me, um, and I started at about 2 o'clock this morning, and I went all day on it. Uh, there are some rental properties down there that rent out for $13,000 a week. Now, I just didn't look at the, at the monsters. I wound up going down into the $400,000 range, and, and basically my personal opinion is, is that the lower rentals have a little bit more bang for the buck because they rent higher than the 50th percentile of the monsters that are down there. Now. When I did the stubby math over here, and what happened is the rental company based the sale, uh, uh, mortgage off of the sale price of $1.4 million. So I'm using the $1.4 million as far as the dollar figure. And basically, they have a $7,000 mortgage. If you take that $187, they're basically making just under $20,000 a month. So they're clearing, or I'm sorry, they're making $12,000 a month before you start taking everything off the top, okay? Now, those that are in the rental business know that, guess what? You get to depreciate the house. The realty fees, taxes, et cetera, everything comes off the top. So they're making $72,000 a year before they even up with Uncle Sugar, Uncle Sam at the end of the year. That's pretty good money. Now, my simple question is, if they're making that kind of money, why are we sending money down there for beach renourishment? Now, Doing additional research going into the Onslow Register of Deeds, what I magically came up with is that many of these people that own homes down there own more than one piece of property for rental property down in North Topsail Beach, okay? Um, I even went into the Carteret County website for Emerald Island, and I found one individual that owned properties in North Topsail Beach as well as Emerald Island. So that's where our tax dollars are going. Per conversation that I had with the LGC today, and it was late, and I'm going off of a conversation, not off of anything that I have black and white, basically what it comes down to is, is the LGC told me that they are not going to approve the 30-year bond for the beach renourishment for North Topsail Beach. So my question to the City Council is, is how is North Topsail Beach going to get more sales tax dollars out of the city in order for it to go down there? And basically what it comes down to is we need to change the sales tax distribution back to the way in which it was, which was 60-40. Thank you very much. Uh, Council, that brings us to agenda item number six in your packet. And I think I did. 
think that's right. Number six is uh, NCDOT agreement for pedestrian traffic improvements on Henderson Drive at the mid blocks crossing. And uh, Anthony Prince will be uh, briefing us on this information here. This is uh, Anthony is the Transportation Services Administrator. Anthony. Thank you, Mayor, members of council. As always, it's a pleasure to be here with you tonight. Uh, the topic of discussion is, of course, a proposed agreement with DOT to improve the uh, mid-block crossing that currently exists at Jacksonville High School uh, on Henderson Drive, of course. But before we get into the specifics of that proposal, what I'd like to do is just take a, a quick step back and give you a brief overview of several other initiatives that we're planning in that area as well to greatly improve the pedestrian safety and connectivity along both Henderson Drive and Gum Branch Road. This is a phased project and uh, it may be counterintuitive, but the first phase is a repaving project. Now, the reason being is twofold, of course. When you resurface a roadway, you create a blank canvas to work from in the future. The road needs to be resurfaced, but once we have that new surface out there, we are able to install pavement markings and other things on the roadway surface, such as reflectors, that help uh, with advanced warning for drivers as well as pedestrians that are more in line with DOT guidelines and federal guidelines as what is currently out there today. And I think as we all know, the pavement markings out there are, are somewhat worn because they've been there for a number of years. With the resurfacing, DOT is also required to improve all of the ADA accommodations. So wheelchair ramps, curb depressions, driveways where need be, they would have to make all of those improvements for that corridor uh, to uh, bring it up to current standard and as such also improve uh, pedestrian accessibility. With those improvements in place, we would then be able to know where the wheelchair ramps are, of course, where the driveways are going to be, and we'll have a better understanding of how we could infill sidewalks along this corridor to fill in the gaps that currently exist. And of course, the yellow arrows on the screen right there indicate where some of the higher priority areas would be for us to focus on. When the sidewalk network is then complete, then there's the question of how do we get them across the intersection? Just as we have done on Western Boulevard and portions of Marine Boulevard, uh, the third phase of this project would be to kind of box that entire intersection with high visibility crosswalks and pedestrian countdown signals that would lend the visibility and safety to the pedestrian traffic that currently exists out there today and of course will more than likely continue to increase in the future. Last but not least, of course, is the improvement that we're talking about tonight which is improving the advance warning systems for that existing mid-block crossing at Jacksonville High School. So overall, this is the uh, end result that we're trying to get to. And of course, it will be a phased approach. Understanding that there's a lot of work that needs to be done, we've negotiated with DOT to, at least at a planning level, divvy out these responsibilities based upon the resources that are available to each respective organization and our ability to execute. So on the screen you see here that current plan is for the city to take the lead on sidewalk infill, okay? And then also the mid-block crossing enhancements that we'll talk about in greater detail in just a couple of minutes. On the other hand, DOT will do the repaving and associated pavement markings, and then they would also design, permit, and install the uh, high visibility <coughs> pedestrian crosswalks. The biggest question, of course, is, you know, we've got this grandiose plan, right? And we feel like we know how we, we could implement in a logical sequence. Uh, the question is funding. Do we have the funding to make it happen? 
And over the past year and a half, we've worked very closely with the DOT to identify existing funds, not the need for future funds, but existing funds that are available to implement all of these improvements within the next year or year and a half. Uh, the funding sources are identified on the screen. The first one there, when Mr. Alford was a Board of Transportation member, he earmarked a certain amount of money at the request of our Transportation Advisory Committee to fund a majority of these enhancements. So DOT money has been earmarked to pay for the mid-block crossing, the crosswalks, and a certain small amount of the repaving work. DOT maintenance funds, with the cooperation of Robert Voss and Karen Fussell, have been identified to pay for the remainder of the repaving work. The only key, um, the only uh, remaining obligation, of course, at that point is sidewalk infill. And we have identified the prior fiscal year CIP appropriation as adequate funding to make all of that happen as well. So in a nutshell, that's the, the, the greater concept that we're trying to implement of course, the mid-block crossing enhancements are just a piece of that, but um, if all said and done, if everything goes according to plan and the council concurs with the plan and, and the method of execution, uh, our goal would be to move forward with implementation sometime during the spring, maybe even the summer, early summer of, of next calendar year. Of course, you know, having the schools out there, the elementary school as well as the high school, it may make more sense to slide that back to, to early summer. So before I move on to the mid-block crossing, are there any questions about that overall project? How much paving is going to happen? Right now, the paving, the paving is not very accurately represented on this map. Um, on Henderson Drive, the limits would be Carmen Avenue to the west, okay? And then the intersection itself, because it's been widened recently, that would not to be, need to be repaid. So on the east side of Gum Branch Road, it would pick up at that seam and then carry for a considerable distance, you know, the dip in the road there where the culvert is, I don't remember what the name of those businesses are there, but for several hundred feet in that direction to accommodate you know, some of the cracking and deterioration that's that's occurred there. So, unfortunately, you know, Henderson Drive in its entirety needs to be resurfaced, and that is a high priority for DOT. We're working out some of the details on the section closer um, to Marine Boulevard between Carmen and Marine uh, in order to, to make some utility improvements before they go in there and actually do the milling and resurfacing. Regarding the mid-block crossing itself, I think we're all very familiar with where it's located and what its intended purpose is. The concern has been voiced multiple times about visibility of pedestrians when they're crossing during dawn and dusk periods. And Mr. Warden, I think a year ago you brought that concern and that concern has also been echoed uh, by a number of folks from the, the school itself as well as, as drivers that have called me. Um, when you look at it in more detail, it's a little bit more complicated than just putting up a street light. Because if you want to see the pedestrian as they're crossing, you know, that seems like a logical response to the problem. The issue is providing enough advance warning to the motorists as they are approaching the crosswalk at speed so that they know somebody's there and they have the opportunity to respond, slowing down in advance of getting uh, you know, on top of the crosswalk itself. Also, as I mentioned, you know, the pavement markings out there are in poor condition. They don't meet DOT or Federal Highway Administration standards, so that's something else that would have to be addressed at some point in the future. The proposal is to install two high visibility LED advance warning signs, and on the right-hand side there, it's, it's an example of what it would look like. Uh, this is an older model. Uh, the new LEDs are much more visible. The design as far as the solar panel and the cabinet itself are much more compact. 
the installation would include two of these on either side of Henderson Drive in advance of the mid-block crossing itself. Communication between the two is radio controlled, so they're pretty much isolated from the, the power grid and they don't require a, a lot of communications. But the way it would work is that these signs would be dark until the point where a pedestrian uh, gets to the crosswalk and just as if they were crossing Western Boulevard with the high visibility crosswalks, you push a button, okay? When that button is actuated, the flashers would start working. That would signify to drivers that somebody is entering the mid-block crossing. The flashers would continue for a certain period of time, however long we feel that it's necessary for the average person to, uh, to cross that distance of Henderson Drive. And then when they're on the opposite side, they would shut off. So these, you may have seen a similar type of application on base. Actually, there are a couple of these signs on Molly Pitcher uh, that are currently in operation. Those flash 24-7, so they never turn off. And, and the reason that we wouldn't recommend that in this particular instance is because that really just desensitizes drivers to what the sign is trying to tell them. So 99% of the time when that, when that sign is in operation, there's no pedestrian there. But when it's activated, almost 100% of the time, there will be a pedestrian trying to cross the roadway. Uh, pavement markings and school zone adjustments are also things that would have to be considered, but that is not a part of this particular agreement. Those would be handled by DOT through the resurfacing project itself. Cost is estimated at approximately $58,000. And I'll mention to you that, that that is an overestimated, that's an overstated estimate. And the reason being is because we want to shoot the estimate high so that when we go to request reimbursement from DOT for all of the associated expenses, you know, any unexpected cost would still be included in that original uh, appropriation from DOT. So it's just a bit of a safeguard on our part to make sure that we get all of our money back. Source would be small construction funds, as I mentioned, the funds that were put aside by Mr. Alford, and it would pay for design permitting and installation. The agreement before you would be the mechanism uh, that would allow us to, of course, request reimbursement for DOT once the project is completed. The benefits. Improved advance warning, that's really what we're trying to get to, particularly during dawn and dusk periods. Now this, this uh, improvement will operate 24-7. If somebody pushes the button, it'll, it'll operate, regardless if it's midday or if it's midnight. Uh, in comparison to other alternatives that DOT allows, this is a very affordable alternative. $58,000 is a lot of money but it's less than half other designs, potentially the end pavement lighting system that we currently have on Hargett Street, um, installing a traffic signal, and it's most certainly a lot less expensive than a more elaborate alternative being potentially an overpass, like you see in other applications. It's low maintenance. It's, as I mentioned, consistent with designs that have been approved and installed on Camp Lejeune, which is good for both sides um, and of course these recommendations not only this one specifically but all of them uh, work to implement the bicycle and pedestrian plan that was adopted by council in 2007 the end goal of course improve pedestrian safety for that particular quarter so mayor and council that concludes my presentation on this item I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have uh, the staff recommendation as included in the package is for um, council approval of the traffic agreement as well as the associated CIP and budget amendments as presented. Council, any questions of Anthony? Thank you. Thank you, sir. All right, council, you're being asked to consider the traffic agreement, CIP, and the budget amendments. Uh, 
Mr. Mayor, I'd like to make a motion that we approve the traffic agreement, the CIP and the budget um, amendments. Uh, and also, I just, as a personal side, I'd like to thank Billy Dennis uh, for bringing this to my attention. I, I can't take full credit, so give it to him. Jerry, were you second? Second. Okay. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. Next, we have a NCDOT agreement for median uh, improvements, phase one on Johnson Boulevard. And Anthony Prince will be presenting this item. Anthony. Thank you again, Mayor and Council. This is a very similar yet different agreement to the one that you just considered. Um, the concept here is to um, rehabilitate an existing island, a traffic island, located on Johnson Boulevard uh, within close proximity of New Bridge Street and, and Hargett Street. Uh, about a year and a half ago, we were talking to Robert Voss, and he mentioned to us that they intended to resurface all of Johnson Boulevard, and as part of that project, they were going to remove that island in its entirety, and then with the contract, come back and reinstall the concrete as it was before. So essentially just refresh the island as it exists. Um, that was concerning for several reasons, of course. Um, first of all, it does nothing to really improve the appearance of our downtown area. You know, this is a great opportunity to impact the way that that particular island looks. And, and second of all, this is part of the greater concept for the Freedom Fountain, and that is, is that phase two of the project? <clears throat> so at this particular location, the Freedom Fountain, it w the, the Freedom Fountain concept would be extended to include decorative landscaping as well as flagpoles for the five service flags that would be located there. So knowing that um, DOT was moving forward with the Johnson Boulevard con resurfacing contract, and of course that work is already complete, uh, we asked Robert if he would consider setting aside the money that had been appropriated for rehabbing that island and working with the city on another approach to that particular area. Um, he agreed, and after several months, we're to this point where the agreement in front of you is to consider a proposal that will allow us to remove the island as it exists, and instead of installing uh, new monolithic concrete, uh, we would move more towards the Freedom Fountain Phase Two concept of having decorative landscaping while setting the stage for the future five flagpoles and their foundations. So at the bottom of the screen here, there is a proposed design. By no means is this a, a final design of what the island would actually look like. But a couple of things that I will bring to your attention are, let's see, one, two, three, four, five. Again, we're setting the stage for those future flagpoles. The design includes decorative concrete that will be cast in that place that certain portions of it could be removed and the Freedom Fountain, or excuse me, the, the uh, flagpole foundations could be inserted right in there and of course the, the poles mounted upon them. Uh, one thing that you really, it's not very visible on this, on this uh, image here, but uh, another carryover are the different species that are being proposed, very similar to everything that was installed with the original uh, Freedom Fountain project. So we're carrying that over into this particular design, of course setting the stage for that, that future improvement. The cost, uh, project budget has been set by DOT at $55,000. And that corresponds to the amount of money they anticipated on spending to rehab that island with concrete. Um, preliminary estimates for the construction indicate that, that we could easily accomplish the project within that limit. And uh, of course, you know, 
uh, depending on where we end up with the final design, we could tweak it to make sure that we're underneath that $55,000 budget. Um, as with the prior um, agreement, the source of funding is small construction funds. However, this is not part of the appropriation that came from Mr. Alford. This is something that uh, Karen Fussell and, uh, and Robert Voss came up with, and of course with the support of our new DOT member, uh, Mr. Michael Lee. The scope of work includes demolition and construction. It does not include design as the prior agreement did. So the MPO has taken the lead on, on looking at different designs. We've barely touched the surface on that. We've got a lot of work to do in conjunction with our parks uh, division as well as uh, uh, Dr. Woodruff and, and city management on coming up with what that final design will look like. As with the prior agreement, um, this is the mechanism that would allow us to seek reimbursement for DOT from DOT for all those associated expenses. I think the benefits of this project are pretty straightforward. Now, this is an opportunity for us to improve the appearance of the downtown really on the DOT's dime. You know, they were going to invest the money in concrete if we choose to take this route, we can reinvest that money in something that's more in line with our clean and green initiative. Uh, builds on other investments, uh, low maintenance. Uh, of course, we don't want to add any undue uh, maintenance requirements to our park staff, so we're looking at things like brick chips and not including any grasses and things of that nature in the design. But most importantly, as I've mentioned many times, it, it really sets the stage for uh, Freedom Fountain Phase 2. So, Mayor and Council, that's my uh, presentation for this item. I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Um, I have two questions. Yes, sir. What are the advantages and disadvantages of installing the flag poles at the same time as you do this project? And what mm -hmm. At this point in time, the proposal is just for the landscaping and the, um, and, and the concrete associated with those kind of landing areas. Um, we don't have a cost estimate at this point on installing the foundations, but that's a good point. If there are some economies of scale, you know, maybe we should look into that as part of the work associated with this project. It would seem, okay. uh, let me also add to that a very good point. Uh, the DOT money is not available for that, but uh, in the actual design, it is our desire to install the base because, as you know from uh, your experiences in construction, what you're going to do is slide that pole into that sleeve. So when we actually have this installed, we will install the five sleeves. The actual poles, we are currently trying to raise donations, uh, a typical flagpole, not including the... Uh, the uh, uh, sleeve is about a $4,800 expense. So we're going to try to raise about $25,000 through <coughs> donations that will cover these five poles themselves. They will be uh, the generally, they will be the same design and generally the same height as the four flag poles that have been placed there next to the Freedom Fountain. Any other questions? <coughs> Thank you. Uh, Council, you've been asked to uh, consider the NCDOT agreement and budget and CIP amendments. Mayor, I'd like to move that the Council approve the agreement between NCDOT uh, for the improvements as mentioned, including the budget and CIP amendments. And just a uh, commendation, too, is that it's very nice to see the staff have effected such a wonderful working relationship with NCDOT and particularly our district engineer. That's good work. It's helping bring about projects like this at very little expense to the citizens of Jacksville. Thank you. Second. And a second. Any other com uh, comments? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? That brings us to agenda item number eight. This is a designation of voting and alternate voting delegates for the National League of Cities Congress of Cities annual business meeting uh, to be held 
uh, November 16th or 13th through 16th, 2013. Um, currently, there's only two members of the council that will be attending: Councilman Jerome Willingham and Councilwoman uh, Council Member Angela Washington. At this time, I would ask if there's any uh, nominations. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to nominate Councilwoman Angela Washington as the voting delegate. Second. Are there any other nominations? I would nominate Councilman Willingham as the alternate voting delegate. Somebody want to second that? Second. Are there any other nominations? Move the nominations be closed and the candidates elected by acclamation. Second. We have a second there. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Okay. Now we go to our reports for the evening. I'm going to start with uh, Council Member uh, Warden. Just a just a quick quick thank you. Um, you know, I'm reminded of how how blessed we are to live in a in a in a great city. And uh, Rolling Thunder folks uh, remind me how lucky we are that we have caring people who want to give back to the to the community. And I'm also um, reflective upon the Beirut Memorial tomorrow. Um, that's also I know. I know Fernando uh, out in the audience tonight uh, has probably worked pretty hard out there today, and I know several people's of staff and so forth. So, thank you for all that you that you do, and as part of your veteran organizations, we are we are blessed to have a lot of good folks here in this community. Thank you. And knowing Fernando, he doesn't even look at it as work, do you? No, that's that's fun for him. He gets him out of real work. Yeah. <laughs> no, he's very dedicated to what he's doing out there. Randy? Uh, no report. Mm -hmm. Um. Okay, I'm going to go down to, to Mr. Uh, Willingham. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I had the uh, enjoy, enjoyable time attending the okay. North Carolina League of Municipalities Conference um, October 13th through the 15th, and I was treated to an outstanding presentation by our own talent, talented city manager, Dr. Woodruff. He has this amazing ability to connect and deliver a message. And I was just delighted to have um, been at his presentation and delighted that the council, um, the league members got a chance to um, enjoy that presentation. He had a presentation um, on the General Assembly and how to connect with your legislatures, your representatives, and have um, a better working relationship and it was very enlightening and entertaining so that was great and um, the following day um, Michael Lazara was recognized for um, graduating from the program that's offered by the North Carolina um, School of Government UNC School of, of Government um, local the local elected leaders Academy and they have um, three levels there, practitioner, master, and uh, mentor levels. And it involves a lot of um, intense uh, training and participation. So Mr. Lazar was recognized. And um, so good job for that. Right, good. Nothing further. Mr. I understand the manager gave an excellent presentation at the League of Municipalities. And understand he's entertaining offers from Saturday Night Live, so <laughs> <laughs> he made me some vacation time. No other report. Mayor Pro Tem was on. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I do have several things to report on. Um, let me start by passing out uh, these real quick. Really. We don't want to pass out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, what I have before you is a Department of Transportation local TIP projects that uh, keep you aware of some of the work that's going on in our community. Um, just briefly, it goes through uh, like the, the TIP projects like Buddy Phillips Bridge that's now complete, but it also goes through the, the various different projects, the, by, uh, the bypass projects, which is known uh, with the designation of U4007. Um, just to keep you up to date. Anyways, you have also a list of resurfacing projects, division projects, 
yes. and um, and um, other projects um, to keep you aware of what's going on. A lot of work locally is being done uh, via the transportation. And I just also want to note that we are extremely fortunate to have Anthony Prince uh, on our team. Uh, he is a dedicated, hardworking individual that I thoroughly enjoy working with. And uh, he has brought a significant uh, uh, professionalism uh, to, to this city in regards to transportation. And we have just a first class uh, a relationship with DOT, and I'm, I'm particularly proud to be part of that. So, and uh, may I just add that uh, I'm also on that board, but uh, the DOT is particularly uh, appreciative of uh, the working relationship they have with us. Apparently, they do not have that same cordial relationship with other uh, metropolitan planning organizations throughout uh, the state, and particularly uh, Eastern North Carolina. So, they're very grateful, and they also speak highly of you, Anthony. So, thank you. Okay. Also, I'd like to uh, report that I attended the Commission for Persons with Disabilities Banquet. I was honored to attend and represent the city um, last Friday evening. It was my honor to present the 20th Annual Bobby Simpson Memorial Award to Mr. George Wiegman, who works tirelessly on behalf of the persons with disabilities. That was a very good event, and uh, I enjoyed representing us on that. Um, also, uh, I'll try to be very quick, but I wanted to address a letter that, that um, a letter to the editor that was published in the ENC public publication by a, by a uh, candidate for city council, and I felt the need to, to clarify uh, some things that were addressed there as the chairman for the, uh, for the uh, tourism advisory committee. Um, the letter indicated that in summary, the, the city council placed the tax a tax item on the consent agenda, keeping it from the public. The letter indicated that the item was placed on the consent agenda, and I quote, because council members who are running for re-election do not have to vote for it in public and without discussion. The resolution that was placed on our October 8, 2013 agenda was a resolution that codified the consensus of the council uh, in which the council had been actively advocating to our delegation in effort to change the spending formula for our occupancy tax, which currently is two-thirds for uh, promotion and one-third for capital projects. Um, we'd been at, we have been advocating uh, a slight switch to one-third, two-thirds. Um, the change would help us be more efficient in supporting capital projects that would create more destination points for our visitors so that we can retain them for an extra day, an extra few days, or a bit longer while they are here, creating more heads on beds. We were asked to submit a resolution in support, which was merely a clerical function and therefore being placed on a, on a consent agenda. Um, contrary to the article, most people do know what an occupancy tax is because they pay for it every time they travel and stay at lodging facilities. The city of Jacksonville has worked on this initiative for over seven years. And I'm not sure how far it dates back, but we've been trying to get an occupancy tax here for quite some time. Um, and with the help of our delegation, we were, we were given the authorization several years ago. Senate Bill 80 authorized the city of Jacksonville to levy a 3% tax on lodging participants. And as part of, of, as part of this authorization, we are mandated to spend two thirds on promotion and one third on capital projects. While this formula may benefit other communities, it's a one size fit all. This distribution method does not add any value to our community because we would be duplicating efforts with the county. Having the money available for worthwhile projects that are destination oriented would bring more value and opportunities to our community. The occupancy tax has reduced the general fund spending well over $1 million, essentially saving the burden on the local taxpayers for the several years that we've been in place. We have funded the Sports Commission, the Museum of the Marine, the Vietnam Memorial, Sturgeon City, Montfort Port Marine Memorial, 
Freedom Fountain, and a countless amount of local festivals and events. Our work continues to provide quality of life events and facilities to enhance our community with no impact to our local citizens. The city of Jacksonville has continued to be a retail hub of the county because of our military bases and because of the hundreds of millions of dollars they've infused in the local economy, making Jacksonville a profitable place to start a business. The city leadership has laid the foundation for success to those businesses that have located here, ensuring zoning, water and sewer, public safety, a transportation network to enhance their success. In closing, I have served on this council for nearly eight years, and I can say that this council has been completely transparent, televising all of our meetings to include workshops and all of our transportation advisory committee meetings are completely televised. We have never placed anything on a consent agenda that would keep council from informing the public or for any sort of political gain. This occupancy tax has benefited the citizens in the community that we live in in many ways. And I hope this just brings clarification. I understand it's a viewpoint, but sometimes facts can be misleading. And uh, I just wanted to clarify that. Um, and my last bit of info is from the TDA, the Tourism Development uh, Authority, which uh, sort of ties into some of the things that I just discussed. Um, the indications uh, of the sponsored Marine Corps Half Marathon produced more than $134,000 worth of economic impact from the investment of the tourism funds at which we, at which we supported. Uh, the Riverwalk Festival and the New River Palooza reports are pending, and I will bring those forward as soon as we have them. Oktoberfest is set for this weekend. Um, the Beirut Memorial Observation um, will be tomorrow, and uh, facilities are reporting 100% occupancy. 750 family members, guests, and others are expected for the banquet and more than 1,200 persons are expected for the ceremony tomorrow. So these point destinations have significant impact in our local economy and quality of life. Um, the occupancy tax changed. I'm pleased to report that the chamber has also endorsed um, our change in the formula that would help address the need to advance investments in sites for economic development opportunities and to improve the quality of life. Uh, again, in closing, thank you very much, May Mayor. I appreciate uh, uh, everyone's effort in this endeavor. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, like you were saying, there, uh, it's, been, it's, it's been a long road to be able to uh, accomplish this, and we've had to fight quite a few battles to to get there. Uh, in in the long run, I think changing the formula will, in fact, benefit this community greatly, as far as. Uh, you know, two thirds. When you're when you're uh, collecting an occupancy tax and you're having to dedicate two thirds of that to merely to promote, there ain't but so much promoting you can do, especially if you don't have the destinations. But if you can turn that formula around and create destinations with it, then it's going to be a greater benefit uh, to the taxpayers here in Jacksonville. And to that point, the reason for that is we would be duplicating efforts. The mm -hmm. County Tourism, uh, the Commerce Center, they currently spend in excess of $300,000. And if we had to match two-thirds, you're talking about close to a million dollars in marketing efforts when you could take those dollars and make destination points that will bring people to your community and retain them here. So there's no need for those duplication of efforts. All right. Uh, the, uh, and thank you very much for that report. Um, I also attended the uh, uh, North Carolina League of Municipalities conference along with uh, Mr. Willingham, Dr. Woodruff, and uh, Mr. Carter. It was very enlightening. Uh, there's a lot of things that are that are on the horizon that we're going to, as cities are going to have to be able to negotiate uh, uh, some changes, uh, changes in the way business is done. So uh, I think that we're probably in for an interesting legislative season, to say the least. So stay tuned for more. Um, tomorrow does mark the, the 30th year uh, commemoration of the bombing in Beirut, Lebanon. Uh, I would encourage 
everybody to come out uh, and the city uh, continues continues to show our continuing commitment uh, to making sure that the memories of those sailors and Marines that were lost in that bombing are not forgotten over time. We want to make sure that their sacrifices stay in our minds, that, you know, what they did for their country uh, will never be forgotten. You know, again, these people were, uh, that we lost over there were I integral parts of this community. You know, a lot of them were uh, Sunday school teachers, Boy Scout leaders, coaches. You know, they played uh, in neighbors to people. Uh, and, you know, this uh, this tomorrow will be uh, a very, very nice tribute. And I do not ever see during my lifetime, and I hope nobody else's, that will ever not recognize and commemorate that that day in, on October 23rd, 1983. And with that, I'm going to ask you one more time. You, you're good. Okay. Uh, Dr. Woodruff. Mayor and Council, many of you have mentioned this, but I do want to go through the schedule for tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow is the 23rd of October, Wednesday, beginning at 6 a.m. at the Memorial Gardens at the Beirut Memorial. There will be a candlelight service. That is 6 a.m. tomorrow morning. At 10.30 a.m. tomorrow morning, same location at the Memorial Gardens, we will have the official ceremony. As many of you have stated, we expect several thousand folks to be there. We would encourage the public to come. We would encourage the public to possibly bring their own lawn chair and to wear comfortable shoes. The ceremony will last about 45 minutes. Seating is available, but on a limited basis. The, when you get there, you will find that there are folding chairs. That folding chair uh, arrangement is primarily for the military personnel and for the families relative to the Beirut bombing. There will be limited public seating available in the stands, but we do encourage people to come. We would also encourage people to remember that parking is limited in that area. Most of the parking that will be available will be in the cemetery, the military cemetery across the street, because of the size of the crowd that we are hoping will be there, which will probably be 1,500 to 2,000 people. We encourage you to come early. Mayor and Council, it was our honor to represent you and this community at the League meeting this past week. It is always a privilege to represent you and to demonstrate to the state the leadership that this city is having and the mark that we are making statewide in issues. As you know, the director of the Municipal League is retiring in January. Uh, he will be sorely missed. He's done an outstanding job. There will be new leadership. And as the mayor said, there are many challenges which are coming up in the next year relative to the legislative delegation. It's essential that each of you and us as staff continue to be active with the league and active with our delegation members. As we stated before, one of our city employees passed away last week, uh, Woody Lemuel Washington, 22 years of service. He will be missed. He is an honored member of our fellowship of city employees, and we certainly dedicate his memory to the quality of what every city employee should strive to be. Lastly, Mayor and Council, the rumor that I may be hired as the, F, as the Clemson offensive coordinator <laughs> after the FSU game is grossly exaggerated. <laughs> now, if they continue the rest of the year as they played against FSU, I may reconsider that <laughs> offer. But for the moment, you will have to continue to uh, have patience with me in this situation. And lastly, as always, it is a privilege to work with you, and we thank you as elected officials for the leadership and dedication you give this city. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Prado? Okay. okay. With that, uh, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Uh, so second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed?